today we're going to be talking about Antarctica and what it's like to do science there. Um, so you are joining us through the Skype a Scientist program, as you're probably aware. Um, we are a nonprofit organization based in Philadelphia, and we are connecting uh, science with the public however we can. I'm going to put in headphones so that noise wouldn't happen again. Um, we are totally donor supported, so if you can support our program, um, either at patreon.com uh, slash Skype a Scientist or uh, paypal.me slash Skype a Scientist, we would really appreciate it. Um, we're also doing trivia nights every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, there will be one week where we do it at 4 p.m. Eastern because our co-host is going to be uh, coming in from Germany um, to do for the European folks. Um, so you can check that out. That's for adults, not for kids. Um, but that's about it from me. So uh, Steph, go for it. Introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning from the East Coast of Australia. My name's Steph McLennan and I'm a geologist at Geoscience Australia uh, and our organisation is quite similar to the United States Geological Survey or the British Geological Survey in that we're a government organisation and we provide geological and geographic data uh, about Australia and Antarctica to the public. I'm an Antarctic geoscientist and so my specialty is uh, the rocks and the landscape in the ice-free parts of Antarctica. And I'll share my screen in a few moments to show you uh, some photos um, and about the work that I'm doing and what I did over summer. Um, and so am I able to share my screen yet? Uh, yes. Yeah. So just real quick before we do that, Erin, um, can you sign that uh, you want to look at the top, top right of your screen? There will be options for different views. Um, and you want to click the one that looks like two rectangles um, on top of each other. If you're on a phone and you're relying on the ASL interpretation, I'm not 100% sure that this works. Um, so for the computer folks, this should be workable. Um, and then when she's done signing, you can go yep. for it. Okay. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to show you a few photos about the work that I do in Antarctica um, and some of the reasons that I love my job um, and even some of the other places um, that I've been really lucky to work. So let's just swap over. Is that coming through all right there? Looks great. There we go. Okay, so this kind of sums up the work that I've been doing in Antarctica. In the background there, we have a glacier. And a few thousand years ago, it was a lot larger than it is now. And it covered the area that I'm sitting on, where all those rocks are. Glaciers are kind of like rock collectors, as they move over areas, they'll pick up debris and, and big boulders and stones in the ice and, and move it across the landscape. As they recede, they leave it behind. And we call that till, is kind of just a collection of all the debris and rocks um, that the glaciers left behind. And my job is, as a scientist, is to come in kind of after the fact, like a detective, and look at what the glacier has left behind, and the kinds of rocks that it leaves, the, um, the shape of the landscape, and all the evidence that tells us maybe what that glacier was doing when it was um, retreating. Maybe it um, retreated in one big episode, or maybe it sort of went backwards and forwards for a little while. And so we're trying to um, piece that back together to tell us about the past env environment, and that can help us predict what might happen in the future as well as things warm. So this is me in the field um, collecting samples. And this is pretty typical of what I'll do in a standard day um, in Antarctica. You can see my um, sample collection there um, just beneath me. We don't need a lot of rock. Um, and especially in Antarctica, we want to be careful about what we take. We only take what we need. So you can see there I maybe have half a kilo, so about a pound of sediment. And that gives us enough um, to analyze in the lab and can give us all sorts of information and evidence to piece together what the landscape used to be like. It's not just glacial rocks that we're looking at here. This part of this area was also covered by the ocean thousands of years ago. And so we look at um, that evidence as well and, and those sediments to piece back together um, what we think the landscape was like. As well as collecting rocks, we collect a lot of photographs and images and videos. Um, and a really useful tool that scientists are using more and more now for that is drones. 
Um, they're pretty cheap, um, some of them, and or you can get really big, um, heavy drones that can carry all sorts of different instruments and sensors. I use a really simple one. And you can see us standing here uh, on the top of a hill. And in the background is that glacier that we saw before. And near it is a, we call that a moraine. It's sort of like a sand dune left behind by the glacier. As it um, melts through the top, it kind of dumps sediment off the edge of it. Um, in some areas, it can bulldoze sediment up ahead of it. Um, and so you get these bars of um, glacial till uh, next to the glacier. But it's really difficult for us to get there. And so using things like drones, we can take really good images of that and see them in a different way than we would, uh, say, if we were on the ground. Something else that I'm doing with my work, as well as the history of this area and what the ice was doing, um, is really looking at what it's like today and what it could be like in the near future, um, especially when it comes to human impacts. So Antarctica, when you think of this great white wilderness covered in snow and ice, we have less than half of 1% of Antarctica not covered by ice. This is the Antarctica I know and love. Um, and you can see it down the bottom there. It's just exposed rock. Um, but some parts, those marine sediments that I was talking about, are really delicate. Um, and these are some footprints that we came across. We don't know when they were made. They might have only been a couple months old, but they will probably sit there um, and be visible in the landscape for years to come. Um, it, we don't have rain to come through and wash things away. You don't have plants that will come and take over walking tracks. Can you imagine sort of walking in your backyard and seeing your footprints there lasting for years and years to come? Um, you can imagine if we have a lot of people moving through these areas, that we can damage it pretty easily. And so down the bottom there is me doing some tests uh, to look at what happens when we um, impact areas, when we damage them with foot traffic and how it recovers over time. And that links the geological history and the modern day, because if we don't understand these areas, how they formed and kind of what they're made up of and how they work, then we can't really protect them very well. We can't manage them very well into the future. These are just a few snaps um, of kind of how I do my work and, and how we get around. So on the top left um, is me on a pretty typical day. You can see I'm dressed up in my um, protective gear, looking like a banana. Um, we, we stick out well against the rocks and snow. On my back, I've got a heavy backpack full of survival equipment. Um, even though we come back to station each night, if something happened and we had to kind of camp out overnight, um, we'd have, or if the weather really turned suddenly, we'd have everything we need to kind of hunker down and, and stay safe and dry. Um, so we carry that with us everywhere we go to stay safe. Um, we walk a lot. So, you know, walking anywhere from sort of 60 kilometres a week, uh, which is about 40 miles uh, on foot, but we get to um, our locations by helicopter, um, bright red helicopters on the top right, which is a really good way to travel around. And it means that we can get drop right where we need to be and then we'll walk um, to other sites from there. On the uh, bottom row there is basically how I get to and from Antarctica. Um, last year I went on the Aurora Australis icebreaker which was really amazing breaking through the sea ice um, in this big orange ship um, to get to Davis Station where I did my work and this year and that was about a two-week trip from Hobart um, in Tasmania, Australia. This year I flew um, and we landed basically on an ice cube. Um, and it was about a four and a half hour flight from Hobart, so a lot faster and a lot less rough. This is obviously not Antarctica. Um, and so my current role is Antarctica and that's my specialty, but um, I've been really fortunate through my research to work in other parts um, of the world, mostly around Australia. And it's a really amazing way to see parts of the world um, in a different way than I would say if I was passing through as a tourist um, and to really appreciate the landscape um, and how it shapes communities and, and how it shapes our country um, in, in different ways. So basically they're just happy snaps, but yeah, it's um, a really amazing way to see the world and to, um, to see your backyard. And that's really one of the things that I love um, about the work that I do. So I'll unshare my screen. That's better. Cool, you ready for questions? Great. Yeah, let's do it. All right, so the first question, we've got a six-year-old who would like to know 
Uh, what's it like to work in such a cold place? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the area that I work in Antarctica is perhaps not as cold as you'd think. And it is summer when I'm there. So in the Southern Hemisphere summer, which is over Christmas for us, um, December, you know, through to March, um, the temperature was around like a few degrees either side of zero Celsius, which is sort of 32 Fahrenheit. So some days I was even like taking off layers of, you know, shell layers and things like that because, you know, you get quite warm when the sun's out um, and it's not so bad. It's actually kind of pleasant. Um, further interior, like further inland and certainly like up on top of the ice sheet, you know, you're at very high elevation, you know, a few thousand feet. Uh, it's very dry. It's a long way from the coast and that's incredibly cold. Um, and that's where those really like record breaking temperatures um, that you see in Antarctica are. Yeah. Cool. Uh, the next question is, do you ever see penguins? Yeah, we do. Um, and they are incredibly funny. They're kind of stupid um, and they're really fascinating to watch. Um, yeah, I really love uh, penguins. Um, because we're on the coast, we have um, in the area that I work, there's rookeries. And so certainly in summer, when the sea ice breaks out, there's a lot of penguins about. Sometimes they'll just wander through the station like they own the place. Um, and when that happens, they kind of do because you need to, you really need to keep your distance from them and, and let them do what they need to do. Um, sometimes we even saw them um, sometimes a couple of kilometers inland away from the ocean. Uh, where they've just gone wandering for whatever reason um, and they're sort of scampering over the rocks and things which was pretty funny um, and yeah we've seen um, certainly seal and penguin, and penguin carcasses fair way from the coast where like that you know maybe they've gotten lost or they were sick or they were injured um, yeah and went a really long way away from um, their food source and from safety but yeah penguins um, yeah we do, we do see quite a lot of penguins we see a dailies mostly yeah a daily penguins cool um, here's a good question. So a lot of scientists that are in Antarctica or have been, um, have been helping people stay busy by giving them advice on what to do when you're stuck inside. So what did you do for fun when you were in Antarctica and not working? Yeah, great question. So because we're working there, but we're also living there, there's a bit of downtime. Um, so I guess day to day, um, the station that I was at and like the Australian stations are really well equipped with kind of, there's like social areas where you can just hang out and have a chat. There's like a table tennis table, pool table. Um, there's a little theatre where we can, you know, show videos and movies and, and binge watch series and things like that. There's a little hobby hut where, where people can kind of, you know, make jewellery and, and things like that. Um, I did, I'm trying to think now, I didn't have a lot of spare time. I was pretty busy <laughs> um, when I was down there. Be out in the field all day and then obviously away from the internet and then catch up on emails and work when I was back in the evenings. But um, yeah, a lot of reading, a lot of crosswords, um, a lot of movies. And then also um, a really good thing to kind of break up the monotony. We have special events um, every couple of weeks, might be on a Saturday night where it's a costume party or a formal dinner to celebrate something. And so they're really fun as well. Everyone gets dressed up and, and looks really nice instead of in their usual daggy field gear. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so how did you first get introduced to this field? Into geology or into Antarctic mm -hmm. geology? Yeah, so yeah, so I guess I can step back to geology. I was never going to be a geologist. Um, I never considered it as a career prospect, um, but I was doing science at university in first year and I needed basically a filler subject, like an elective. Um, and I had some friends doing geology and I thought, yeah, that sounds kind of fun. They do field trips and learn about volcanoes and yeah, why not? And I kind of just ended up loving it. Like um, I'd always loved all sorts of different kinds of science, really struggled to sort of pick one to focus on. Um, and geology and earth science is great because it's just draws on every kind of discipline to understand the world. It has chemistry and physics and maths and even biology. Um, and so you can kind of specialize in different areas um, and kind of draw on any kind of science and even social science that you like. And so after that subject, I just kept doing more and more geology, certainly found the areas that I really enjoyed, which is like sedimentology. So understanding rocks when they start to weather um, and landscape evolution. So what happens when rocks come to the surface and, and how does that shape the landscape and, and how does that work? So yeah, that's kind of 
how I ended up there. I guess for my current role, I joined Geoscience Australia um, as a graduate. We have a graduate program straight out of university. Um, and I just got like a four month kind of project with my team, um, the Antarctic Geoscience team. And kind of the rest is history. Um, we sort of like raised the idea of, oh, maybe you could join permanently. And like, yes, yes, we need to make that happen. Um, and yeah, just sort of following up leads and, and um, not taking no for an answer, I think as well, yeah. Very cool. Um, how about how many people work with you in your team when you're in uh, Antarctica? We're a small team, there's only two of us. Uh, oh, so wow. it's, yeah, just me and a colleague. On station, there's over 90 people um, doing all sorts of different jobs, a lot of tradespeople, other scientists, um, things like that. But when we're off station doing our work, it's just the two of us, which is great. Um, we collect samples together, we take observations together, and then kind of write it up at the end. Um, and some depends on the science that you're doing. Sometimes you'll need a much bigger team with different kinds of expertise. Um, this one, we, I guess for this project, like we deliberately kept it quite small and light so that we'd have the best chance of getting basically beds on station and, and the support to get to, it, get to Antarctica. Cool. Um, what's the most important or interesting part of your job? in your opinion? Oh, so much of it's interesting. Um, I think something um, that really struck me, like I used to do field work in rural and remote Australia, um, and that's pretty full on because you have to be quite self-sufficient, um, you know, with heat and other things, it can be quite dangerous. But you're always, you know, you're generally sort of near towns and or, you know, it can be close to help. Um, Antarctica is next level in terms of being self-sufficient and organized. Um, although we have the station there and, um, you know, really it gets resupplied once a year, we have to have everything that we need with us. Um, there's no sort of hardware store that we can stop, you know, buy to fix things. Um, there's no office works to go and get even stationery and tape and things like that. Um, and as well, you know, even just getting there, it, you know, can take weeks um, and getting home this year took weeks because um, we had delays with the, with the flights and the ice runway we were taking off from, um, couldn't open for quite a while because it was too warm. And so, yeah, being like super flexible, really self-sufficient um, and kind of just rolling with the punches. Yeah, um, I'd say that's really interesting. It's sort of more of a people thing than a science thing, but it's interesting. And I, I really enjoy that aspect. Very cool. Um, so how can you tell what rocks in the till are special or something that you should test? So we don't really look for um, like individual rocks. We kind of look at what the whole thing is. Um, so um, I guess some of the different analyses that we'll do is things like grain size. So that's looking at um, how much of that, you know, bag is bigger cobbles, pebbles, you know, sand size down to like tiny clay particles. And that can give us an idea of the different geological processes that might have deposited it. Assuming, you know, it's glacial, but maybe there was more water involved. Maybe um, the ocean kind of reworked it. So it can give us a few insights into that history. Um, then we'll look at its chemistry. So just like, you know, crush it all up what is in there and we can use that to figure out the minerals and then the rocks. We'll look at the minerals themselves um, and that gives us insights as well into the different um, rocks and that can help us track where those, where that sediment came from. Is it kind of really local in which case we'd expect it to um, all kind of be the same and um, or is it come from a really long way away with the ice in which case maybe it would have a mixture of different rocks um, in there. Yeah. Cool. Um, uh, a 12 year old from Selkirk Middle School would like to know, uh, do you ever find bones in the glacial till? Ah, oh, I haven't. Um, I guess in theory you could, but bones compared to rocks are pretty fragile. Um, and so I wouldn't expect them to survive very long. Yeah, good question cool. though. Thanks. Um, Lily, age six, would like to know, why is your safety suit yellow and black? That's a great question, Lily, especially because I don't really think yellow is my colour. Um, that's just, um, that's the Australian Antarctic program. All of our safety gear is yellow and black. Um, different nations have different colours. I guess with the yellow and black, it stands out really well on the ice. Um, 
actually on the against the rock we do sometimes blend in and so I usually have like a big fluoro orange flag or like vest with me when we're calling in a helicopter at the end of the day we have to wave that um, to kind of draw attention to ourselves because um, otherwise they might miss us but um, yeah I guess yeah our, our clothing's been yellow for a really long time maybe one day they'll they'll change it um, but yeah Sounds good. Banana skins for now. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Andrew says that my daughter would like to ask Aunt Steph what other types of animals you see other than penguins. Uh, hi. Uh, my brother and niece and nephew are watching from Southern California. So hi, guys. <laughs> Great to hear from you. Um, other kinds of animals. So yeah, lots of penguins. We also see, see seals um, because they... Um, breed on the land as well um, in the ice free areas so we're kind of competing a bit for real estate there like we people tend to visit these areas and it's a real hot spot for um, breeding animals so yeah we see seals um, we see other kinds of birds like snow petrels which are beautiful white um, very very quiet small birds and then they just have these jet black eyes and, and beak and they're really beautiful um, yeah lots of different kinds of birds um, what else do we see um, last year I saw whales um, when we were at sea, which was really amazing. Um, there are other crit critters that live um, in Antarctica, but they're really tiny. Um, and so you'd need like a, a hand lens or, or a microscope um, to see some of them, but they're incredibly tough critters. One of my favorites um, is a tardigrade, they're called water bears or moss piglets. They're these, if you see images of them, um, they're really, they almost look like pig balloons like they're they're really um kind of cute and ugly at the same time um and so they live um in the ice free areas as well in some of the vegetation but um yeah we see some animals but also perhaps not as many as you might see um you know wandering around in the forest or something like that awesome um this is a, a question that i didn't even realize i'd be interested in the answer of uh, until right now uh so the question is do your lips ever peel so like do you have to go through some hardcore skincare routine to keep functional in antarctica yeah so it's really dry um and that yeah wreaks havoc with your skin um i guess my um concerns not so much the cold it's actually the sun um i'm pretty fair and i burn super easy and we're there in summer where it's almost 24 hours of daylight um, and the sun's really harsh there um, because of the thin ozone layer. So I probably spend more time thinking about keeping myself protected from the sun um, than I do about keeping warm. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of sunscreen um, and then, yeah, a lot of moisturizer. Um, certainly you wake up in the mornings um, feeling like your mouth's full of carpet, um, so dry. Yeah, definitely when I sort of first arrive, like I'll get nosebleeds and things like that just because everything's so dry and then you kind of adjust. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, so has anything ever gone wrong on one of your expeditions or have you ever felt like you were in danger doing field work? Yeah, great question. Um, so yeah, like I showed that pack, you know, we've got an ice axe and, you know, a sleeping bag and kind of, it's called a bivy bag. It's basically like a tent flyer to keep us dry, we've got spare clothing, first aid kits, radios, personal locator beacons, like heaps of equipment to keep us safe. And I guess as well, when we're out, like we'll talk to the weather forecasters and the helicopter pilots and the operations coordinator. And like, it's never a decision that we make alone um, to be out or to come back in if the weather's turning. Um, so, you know, I always feel really safe um, and you know like um, confident when we're out away from station um, I guess the most dangerous situation I've been in though was on station I think I was walking from like the mess to my office in the science building and my pack on and my boot caught like a stone and I just went down like a sack of potatoes <laughs> hit my head like broke my glasses ended up with oh, a bit no. of a black eye um, just from like stacking it and being a bit unco um, so I guess the the danger there is is me I'm the I'm the dangerous situation for all our safety equipment yeah cool um are there buildings where you're doing field work or is it all like tents like what are we working with yeah so I'm based at a research station uh, called Davis which is one of Australia's three re research stations um, on the Antarctic continent and that's a permanent station so we have people there year-round there's about 24 people there over winter at the moment and then over summer we have over 90 people and that has um, 
you know, mechanical workshops, it has a science building with labs, it has accommodation for everyone, kitchens, so it's, it's a proper little sort of village settlement. Um, and then, like I said, we'll take a helicopter out, maybe not that far, maybe anywhere from five to 20 kilometers away from station in this area. Um, and out there, there's just a couple of um, huts, kind of refuges, and sometimes people take like recreational trips and stay there over the weekend. Um, and so we can use those kind of in an emergency. We don't usually use them. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of a, a mixture. And because we're kind of local to a station, yeah, we don't need to set up camps or anything like that. Um, but if you're much further away um, and certainly up on the ice sheet, yeah, you'd be using um, tents or, um, you know, like cabins on, on tracks and things like that to set up those sort of more like deep field camps. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's see. Are there insects there, like mosquitoes? No. And that's one of the things I love about fieldwork in Antarctica is, um, yeah, there's no mosquitoes, there's no flies, there's no spiders, there's no snakes. Um, yeah, and if it, um, you know, if the weather turns, it might snow, it'll get really windy and cold, but there's no, not really much rain at all. We had a little bit of rain this summer, but uh, not much rain. So compared to doing some field work in other places where you can, you know, be up to your waist in mud or it's raining or getting bitten by mosquitoes, it's actually a lot more pleasant. So yeah, no, um, something we are really cautious of though is introducing things like flies and mosquitoes and, and moths. So all of our equipment, all of our gear is um, thoroughly, thoroughly checked for seeds and insects um, before we leave for quarantine. Um, and we have like special protocols that if someone happens to discover something like in maybe some food or in some um, equipment that it's kind of captured, it's, um, you know, safely stored and um, monitored um, so that we can keep track of those invasive species. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's see. Uh, how, what's the longest you've ever been out in the field and how long have you been going out for? That's from T Teddy, age 10. Hey, Teddy. Um, so we pretty much just go out like for the day. So my day would start with just breakfast and then we might be in a helicopter at like nine o'clock and then we'll get picked up kind of, you know, five, six o'clock in the evening and be back in time for dinner. So um, it's kind of like a nine to five job in that sense. Um, but I guess in terms of like total deployment away from home, um, the last two years, um, I've been gone about 11 weeks. Um, and so, you know, some of that's time where we're on the ground working and a lot of that is just transit time, like getting to and from Antarctica. Cool. Yeah. Um, the Ramos family would like to know, uh, at the research station, do you have your own bedroom? Yeah, it's pretty great. Um, yeah, in for Australian bases, we, we pretty much everyone has their own room. Some, um, some people share if we're really tight on space. Um, I know other programs will share rooms, but yeah, we get our own room. It's quite small. You just have a little desk and a, and a little bed. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's pretty neat. Yeah. Great. Um, Mackenzie would like to know, why is Antarctica so dry? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, I don't have a really good answer for that at the moment, um, but I will throw some links up on Twitter after I'm done with this for questions that I don't know or that I'll provide some info on and I'll see if I can get you a good answer. Sounds good. Um, how do you maintain your circadian rhythm when you're in Antarctica? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, especially over summer, you know, it is near 24 hour daylight. We, um, I remember sort of just happened to wake up at 2 a.m. one day and looked out and it was broad daylight. Um, it's it's quite strange. I didn't really find it an issue. Um, you know, I was still, I guess, walking all day and, and working hard, like you kind of get tired as well. That helps kind of prompt you to go to bed. Um, our rooms do have like good blackout curtains, so you can make it dark. Some people, it really messes them around. Um, and so we have a doctor on station and they can kind of help like people with good sleep hygiene and, and giving tips and advice um, on, yeah, keeping like your circadian rhythm going and, and staying healthy. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, what do you eat when you're there? So we've had a lot of questions about food, be it like, do you have to hunt for your food? What do you eat for breakfast? <laughs> like what is <laughs> Yeah, food is really important because um, it's a really good defense against hypothermia. If you've got a full stomach and good energy stores, you're less likely to, um, you know, to um, start succumbing to hypothermia, um, which I'm all about. Like, I think that's, that's great that um, food's so well encouraged. Um, we have chefs on station that cook meals. And so it's kind of like dinner is, you know, hot 
um, kind of like a, you know, a small buffet, like um, just, you know, choose with salads and, and, and things like it might be curries or stir fries or, or um, like roast meat or something like that. Um, lunch, I tend, cause we're off station. So lunch, if you're on station, lunch is like a hot meal um, or salads and things like that. Um, being out away, we just take sandwiches, um, you know, just something that we can throw in our packs nice and light. Um, I always take a thermos of tea with me um, cause it's um, really nice to have something like hot um, when you're really cold. And breakfast is kind of just like help yourself to cereals and toast um, and things like that. But there's an amazing snack kind of cupboard or corner where you can sort of help yourself to snacks at any stage, um, like, you know, soup or, or noodles or things like that. So yeah, um, we're really well fed. Um, and yeah, given that they pretty much just get one shipment of food a year. Um, yeah, they do amazingly well um, in keeping like really good variety and, and really great quality of food. So yeah, we definitely don't go hungry. That's amazing. But it's one yeah. year. That's like such good planning. Um, yeah, yeah. From Grayson, age eight, how many scientists are working in Antarctica right now? Hey, Grayson, great question. So I wouldn't be able to give you like a definite figure, but at the moment it's coming into winter. Um, and so summer is really busy. You know, the population of Antarctica explodes over summer uh, when the weather's good uh, and people can get out and about. Over winter, um, definitely scales back. Um, and depending on the science you do, like I need to be there in summer because there's less snow, obviously I can see the rocks better and I need to be out and about. So, um, we need better weather for that. And then sometimes projects that happen over winter. Yeah. It depends on the science that they're doing. Um, just in terms of like scientists relative to other, you know, um, professions. Yeah. I wouldn't really be able to say, and it would definitely vary station to station, country to country, depending on what they're doing. Um, but definitely over winter, you know, you've got, um, and over summer as well, you have like mechanics to keep all the machines running and to keep, you know, the power on and the lights on and, and carpenters and electricians and plumbers to keep the stations running and weather forecasters and weather observers and, and all sorts of different people. So scientists um, sort of don't make up the dominant population. Yeah. Uh, Micaiah would like to know, do you test the glaciers and the rocks or just the rocks? Great question. I just test the rocks, um, which is what the glaciers left behind. But um, we do uh, work with glaciologists who do test the ice um, and look at the structure of glaciers and how they work and how they're moving. Um, and sometimes you get people crossing over between the two. Um, but yeah, I definitely focus on the, the rocks. Um, I guess the rock record that the, the glaciers left behind. Yeah. Cool. Um, Kona would like to know, do you get tired of being around the same people all day, every day? Um, do you know, so yeah, like we've got a field team of two, get to know each other really well. Um, not really, like, you know, and even the people on, you know, other people on station, um, you know, everyone has such fascinating lives and so much to talk about. Um, yeah, everyone's really like, um, interesting and has such diverse experiences either in Antarctica or elsewhere they've worked and so it's always someone really interesting to talk to um, but also you know it's I think it's important to have your own time and you can kind of retreat into your room just to read a book and, and have a bit of a break um, but yeah no and I guess you know I'm only there for a few months if it was a year maybe that'd be a little bit different um, but yeah no certainly not tired of seeing the same people cool that's a relief um, yeah Abby, age 11, from the Carver School would like to know, um, have any animals had an attachment to you or any other scientists while you're in the field? Oh, great question. Um, for me personally, no. And that's because I try and avoid the animals. Um, I don't need to be near them. Um, and certainly things like seals, they can be kind of dangerous um, if they feel threatened. And you know, even penguins as well, they're pretty friendly and curious, but we don't want to bother them or feel like um, they're in any danger um, or we don't want to change their behavior at all. So if we see a penguin or a seal, we we'll, might observe it for a while and then just keep our distance. Um, have had penguins, like if you stay really still and if you're really patient, um, they might come up to you and kind of like peck at your shoes or something. I have had that before, which is really cool, but they then get bored and move on to something else. So yeah, no. Um, they don't really form attachments like that. Cool. All right. I have no idea what this question means, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, All right. We'll give it a go. Team Amundsen or Team Scott? Does that mean anything to you? 
No, I don't think so. Cool. Who knows? It could be. Split. Yeah, I'm sure no I'll find out later. <laughs> I thought maybe it was like two research stations in Antarctica. I had no idea. But okay. Uh, anyway, um, how many glaciers have you seen in your life? Ah, uh, so for work, I've seen a couple. So the glacier um, closest to where I work um, near Davis is called the Sorsdal Glacier. Um, and so I've seen that, um, which is really cool. Um, definitely flown over others, like getting between stations. Um, but, you know, when you're way up in the sky, it's a little hard to, to see them. Um, but I've also seen, I guess, glaciers like in New Zealand, um, you know, uh, when I was university, we did field trips um, to New Zealand, which was really phenomenal to see, um, like the Franz Josef and the, and the Fox glaciers there. Um, but yeah, um, I guess I chased the rocks left behind by glaciers um, more than I see actual glaciers. Cool. Um, by the way, those two people I, I've just learned are the two that uh, raced to the South Pole. Um, yeah. So we can remember that. For the next I, didn't, I didn't know I needed to pick a side. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. Uh, okay. How many books do you take with you? Great question. Yeah, I take uh, quite a lot of books. Um, and yeah, some I didn't really get to read this summer. As I said, I was really busy. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I definitely take books that um, are kind of not Antarctica related, um, that, you know, can kind of help you like escape a little bit um, from where you are. Yeah, um, but I take, yeah, a lot of crosswords. Um, I took, I love knitting, like, cause it keeps my hands busy. Um, and so, yeah, I made a sweater when I was down there this summer um, doing that. So yeah, books and, and other activities, yeah. Nice, um, let's see, almost 12, Stanford Online High School. Um, I read that you are also a drone pilot. How did you learn um, and how do you use this skill in Antarctica? Yeah, so um, yeah, I got my drone license. Um, so I can fly small drones, like up to seven kilos. Um, we use a small sort of 900 gram drone, so like around two pounds. Um, and it's quite small. And because of that, it can only carry the camera on board, but it's a really great camera. It's a 20 megapixel camera and we can take videos and photos with that. Um, and so I showed a photo earlier of um, uh, me and my colleague Jody um, standing in front of the glacier, you know, looking back with the drone. And so you can use that to kind of put it up in the air and um, take photos of things that I can't really see well from the ground. Also, what we do with it is we'll set it on like a defined flight path and it will fly back and forth, taking overlapping images of a particular area. We can use software to stitch that together afterwards and it gives us a 3D model um, at really high resolution of that ground surface. And what we can do is then repeat that maybe every few years and compare them and see how they're changing over time. Um, and so that's what I use drones for. Um, there's also some of the bigger drones you can, as I said, you can attach different sensors um, and different instruments to them. And that allows you to observe um, the environment in kind of different ways, like seeing it with different eyes, um, whether it's um, like a hyperspectral camera or a multispectral camera. And that's looking at different parts of um, the light spectrum. And that can give us different characteristics, maybe related to vegetation or moisture or different minerals in the ground. Yeah. Awesome. Um, let's see, Matilda would like to know, what is some equipment that you're using in your work? So much equipment. Um, and actually some of it is kind of low tech. Um, so when I'm just taking samples, it's literally like a little hand trowel that you get from the garden store um, and a plastic bag and a permanent marker to label it. Um, and then I write handwrite notes in my field notebook. Um, then you go to something a little more high tech like the drone, um, which, you know, um, like I said, I got my you know, license for that and, and did training um, and certification to be able to fly that safely. Um, what else do we use? Um, cameras are really important. You know, um, when we're collecting samples, we want to not just collect like the little thing in front of us, but kind of um, like build its context and build its story. And so, you know, we have to observe, like, is that sitting in a valley or on the side of a hill? What does that hill look like? Um, what else is around it that might give us clues to how it formed? And capturing that also with photos is really important. So even just like a phone camera is really important piece of equipment to have. Um, when we're like back in Australia with all our samples, the laboratories use, um, yeah, all sorts of different equipment, like um, 
um, like an x-ray diffraction instrument to look at the mineralogy, like to look at the minerals um, or like mass spectrometers to work out the chemical components. So yeah, lots of different, um, lots of different tools. Cool. Um, what is the most exciting or interesting finding that's come from your work in Antarctica? Yeah, so something that, um, I guess, so one of the things that in like preparing to go out, we've got really great satellite images of this area um, and they're quite high resolution. Um, and so from that, we can kind of look at the landscape from the air, from the satellite and kind of get a sense of like, start to guess what we think it will look like. And then when we're on the ground, uh, we call it ground truthing, and it's basically going, right, we thought this was a hill or um, you know, a, a particular valley from the air. What does it actually look like on the ground? You know, does, that, does that marry up? Um, and I reckon maybe a third of the time we'd get to a location and go, oh, we didn't quite expect this, um, or this was a little bit different um, from what we expected. And that um, was definitely things related to the permafrost. Um, because it's a permanently frozen ground, um, it kind of freezes and thaws and it moves rocks around, it can move boulders, um, starts to sort things as well as it kind of like churns through the soil. Um, and, you know, we couldn't really see a lot of evidence from that um, in the satellite images. We expected it to be there, but actually seeing it on the ground was, and the scale of it, like literally moving boulders, um, was really incredible to see. That's awesome. Um, okay, so we try to keep these sessions to 45 minutes, um, mm -hmm. and I, the time has flown because we're already there. So um, we like to end these sessions by asking everybody the same two questions. So mm -hmm. question one, what is something that you wish everybody in the world knew about your area of expertise? And then the second question is, what do you wish everybody in the world knew about literally anything? It can be as significant or as silly uh, as you'd like. That's, those are my questions. Okay, um, so in terms of my field, so not just Antarctic geoscience, but geology and earth science in general is just so fundamental to our world, our planet and, and how we live in it. It changes you know, how you see the landscape and, and how you see the world. Um, and so like, that's definitely the biggest thing I've got from it. And so I'd encourage anyone, you know, if you have the opportunity to try taking an earth science subject, whether it's in school or college, you don't have to do a whole degree. Um, but yeah, if you have the chance to learn a bit more about earth science, um, absolutely do because it'll, it'll blow your mind um, and change your world. And it's more generally like talking to students who are maybe thinking of like, you know, am I cut out for a career in science or, you know, um, should I pursue a career in science? If your grades like aren't stellar and you know getting like you know outstanding marks, it's not the universe telling you that you shouldn't be a scientist. It's okay. Um, you know my best subjects in school were like English and history, definitely not science, but I really loved it um, and like was able to keep pursuing it. And I'm doing okay. So <laughs> yeah, definitely like if you have a passion for science or technology, engineering, maths, um, yeah, like hold on to that passion and, and keep feeding it don't don't feel like if you're um, not achieving the marks that you want that um, it doesn't mean that you're not cut out for it so yeah keep on awesome I co-sign that big time um, okay also I didn't get great grades in school and yet here we are uh, okay so that's it for today uh, we are talking about COVID-19 tomorrow with uh, some virologists at Rockefeller um, in New York City um that is happening i don't remember what time but you can check it out on our website i can do that right now um other than that we are a nonprofit organization tomorrow's happening at 1 p.m eastern time okay um and we really need everyone's support to keep doing this work um and so if you can support us at paypal.me skype a scientist or patreon.com skype a scientist it allows us to do this stuff and allows us to do even more um, we're really, really, really hoping that before the end of the year, we can hire a part-time assistant to help me uh, out so that we can put more good science out there. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you all for coming. Steph, this was so cool. Like, getting a view into your job is like just awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you for getting up so early. Uh, <laughs> very much appreciated. And Erin, thank you for signing for us. Thanks, Erin. You're the best. Uh, all right, we'll see y'all tomorrow or whenever. Thanks.
Bye. Thanks. Bye.